Settle in, class. I know it's an exciting day. It's the start of your journey. Yes, there's a lot of general knowledge to learn, but eventually we all have to choose a path to focus on. We'll be doing a video for each class, breaking down their specializations, strengths and weaknesses, ease of play, and more. Let's start with a basic overview. In D&D, your class is your main career path, the broad type of power and skill set you have. There are 12 main classes in your handbook, and an extra one revealed in Tasha's Cauldron. The class determines your hit die and core abilities, as well as granting you proficiency in things like armor, weapons, tools, saving throws, and skills. This is your area of focus, and grants you increasingly powerful abilities the longer you stick with it. Each class is divided into a number of categories known as a subclass, which more narrowly define your source of power and specialization. These grant additional abilities, proficiency, spells, etc. In some cases, they'll even change how your features work, like making a core ability more powerful or expanding your spell list. We'll touch on these subclasses more in future videos, but for now, let's dive into the classes. Let's start with Artificer, the one that was recently revealed. This is your Hedge Mage, your Tinkerer, your Demolitionist. Artificers are mages who use wit and creativity to use and make magic items. And yeah, make. Making magic items is kind of our whole thing. We don't get as many traditional spells, but we infuse items with raw power. We're highly versatile and have a version that fills any role you need. On top of that, the most powerful magic items make you attune to them, and you can only typically attune to three at a time. Unless you're an artificer and eventually get double that. Maybe you like the mecha magical might of magic custom armor, golems, turrets, a flamethrower. Or maybe you're like me and just love brewing potions and casting with a spoon. However you want to spin it, if magical items suit you, then so do we. Now the next class needs little description. You know it, you love it, the barbarian. Barbarians are brick houses with higher HP than any other class. They're the only ones who can eventually break the limit of strength and durability, becoming legendarily mighty. They feel emotion to the primal root and connect with a core power that gives them supernatural ability. The source of this is buried. For some, it's a connection to the Fae, or spirits, or nature itself. Others tap into their fight-or-flight mechanism, or they might actually get too angry to die. Their features almost entirely revolve around hitting hard, hitting harder, and ignoring the fact that they were hit. They don't even wear armor, adding their constitution modifier to their AC. Barbarians are a sledgehammer of a class. Not suited for every role, but when you need one, accept no substitute. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the Bard. Instead of a specialty tool, these are a jack of all trades. So much so that it's one of their main features, letting them get a bonus even on the few skills they aren't proficient in. They're among the most varied spellcasters, even taking spells from other classes. But at their core, they excel at support. They can heal, they can make their allies better, they cover pretty much any skill check, and they can temporarily plug pretty much any hole that needs filling. Speaking of which, let's air out the jokes for a second, because a Bard's great charisma lets them do more than just flirt. They can be a daring swashbuckler or a cunning spy, the wise old keeper of history, or a seeker of legend. You can make one a flashy performer, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just as valid to be the quiet kid in the back of your band class. If you're interested in being a jack of all trades, or supporting your allies, or even just having your words physically hurt, consider choosing Bard. You know what isn't a choice though? Being a cleric. A cleric is usually a priest of some respect, but not always. Divine powers are bestowed at the wishes of the god, and while that can be as a reward, it's often from the god seeing the potential in the person. Even a high-ranking member of a religion might not have divine power. You might be well known, but you might just be a grunt with a violent past, and right now that god needs a field medic. You might not have even known they existed before getting zapped with power and having great responsibility thrust upon you. Powers like driving off or destroying undead, and eventually being able to just ask the god to directly intervene. The rest of the power depends on the god and which aspect you embody. If you're looking to draw power from the divine, have a link to the gods for better or worse, and serve in often unusual ways, consider cleric. And don't feel pressured to heal. I mean, you can if you want, you can be the best healer around. But if that's not your style, go with Grave, or guard secrets with knowledge, praise the sun, worship the storm, or magic, or bloodshed. Whatever flavor of priest interests you, we got you. You could even be the person who got in trouble for starting a fight club in your congregation's youth. And it was all cool when everyone involved had a blast, but people didn't like you throwing children or the kid-shaped holes in the wall. And you left it pure on a cord, but there is tension for years. That one's the nature domain? I think, at least. The guy I know who did that called himself the king of the squirrels, so I guess it works. But if you want to actually rule the squirrels, Think about the druid. Druids are worshippers of nature, its wrath and its protector. They're not the toughest in their normal form and can't use metal weapons or armor, but more than make up for that with a might of full spellcasting, many of those spells being exclusive to them. They can also turn into animals. They focus on balancing natural forces, like growth and forest fire, fungal decay, and the cosmos, or just buffing that shapeshifting until they don't need weapons because they're a mammoth. If you want to bring nature's fury to bear, especially if you want to use actual bears, the druid makes a fine choice. I would have a transition for 
fighter, fight me. The fighter is exactly what they sound like. They're a basic combatant that's just really good at their job. Second highest HP, access to all armor and weaponry, knights and mercenaries and town guard alike. They pick a fighting style that will be their specialty and it does grant them bonuses, but they excel at any type of mundane combat, like sword and shield or archery. They get general improvements to shrug off small blows or get extra attacks in, but their primary skill is their versatility. They get to improve their stats or gain a feat twice as often as everyone else, allowing for great customization. The subclasses just add specialization to that, like magic or a mount, or just getting really good at landing a critical hit. If you're looking for a standard, reliable warrior with a good toolbox of combat features to customize, the fighter is a great choice to consider. And if nothing else, they have the samurai, which I know a lot of you are looking at. But if that's your style, you might want to shift your eyes to the monk. We're talking about a martial arts master. They hone their bodies into deadly weapons, often at remote monasteries where they learn inner peace. That's the standard origin, at least. But what actually matters as a concept is that they've honed their body and mind. Your basic monk can catch projectiles, run across water and up walls, effectively speak every language, and release a flurry of punches with the strength of an actual sword. They don't even need to wear armor. They add their wisdom to their dexterity, dodging on pure instinct. And that's before their subclass lets them teleport through shadow, or throw out an energy blast, or summon an avatar of their own soul to hit you even harder. You'll hear people saying that the monk is bad because the other classes can hit harder or tank more or cast spells, but you know what they can't do? Run across the castle moat and up the wall, do a triple flip off the other side, punch out every guard and stun the big bad with a boot to the head. And sometimes there's more to life than having the biggest number. If you just want to do cool stunts and punch people, the monk is the way to go. That said, if numbers are what you care about, do I have the frontline fighter for you. The paladin is traditionally a crusader in shining armor, devoted to tirelessly upholding truth and justice, a tradition which is dead. Because functionally speaking, the paladin just draws power from extreme devotion to an oath. Doesn't even have to be from a god. A paladin just has a code and obsession so strong it manifests as divine power. So you don't have to go deus phone. You can be after revenge or trying to protect the forest, or just be so narcissistic you actually got power from it. Like the fighter, they have a high HP with access to all armor and weaponry, and pick a fighting style to specialize in. Unlike the fighter, they have healing and magic by default. They also gain aura abilities, which make all allies around them tougher in a variety of ways. Their spellcasting might not be as strong as a dedicated caster, but they have a panic button called Smite. Whenever they hit an enemy, they can turn a spell slot into a burst of divine energy for an extra boost of damage. And that's not even getting into their actual spells. If you want to stand on the front lines in heavy armor, wrecking foes with bursts of damage and healing yourself if things get rough, the Paladin might be for you. Just try not to drag the party along with your shining zeal. But if you'd like to drag them through the wilderness, the ranger might be a perfect match. A ranger is a warrior at home in the wild. Hunters and scouts, wanderers and wardens, those who reject society, and those who protect it from outside threat. With high HP, medium armor, and a fighting style specialization, if you want a wild warrior that can survive off their own power, the ranger is the way to go. The subclass gives you all sorts of amazing abilities as well. Mark your foes for extra damage, sneak through the underbrush, summon a swarm of nature incarnate to take the shape of whatever you like and bend it to your will, and to top it all off, they have a bit of magic as well. I will admit that learning about their abilities can be a little confusing. Basically speaking, the original ranger and especially the beastmaster were just not good. Now people will scream all sorts of ways to fix it at you, but just remember two things. The subclasses outside the PHP fixed most of the issues, and Tasha's Cauldron brewed up fixes for the rest. So if you want to be an awesome warrior of the wood, ignore the hate for the old versions and pick up the ranger. Just, uh, one request? This is one of those classes that really tend to attract the whole lone wolf type. Which is fine, but if you want to be part of an adventuring group, be part of it. Don't try to pull the whole I work alone routine unless you actually want to be alone, because decent people respect that boundary and leave. I understand the appeal of the whole I hate all of you idiots, you'd be lost without me thing, but it just isn't fun in practice. Nobody's here to convince you to do the thing you sat down to do. So expect your next thought to be Wait, where are they going? And this problem isn't inherent to the ranger or anything. It's just one of those classes that tend to attract the archetype as you're naturally suited to living alone. The other main offender of that Sundere act, and often a litany of crime, is the rogue. Look, you don't have to be a thief. It's just always a temptation to steal when you need cash and can get away with it, but you could be a spy or a scout, an assassin or a pirate. The core of this class is basically just risk versus reward. Mediocre health and light armor, but a big damage boost if you're close and have the upper hand. You're proficient in so many skills and can even double your bonus to a few to make yourself unmatched. But all that extra maneuverability and confidence makes it easy to overextend. Your abilities tilt the odds in your favor or mitigate your failure, but you're still making a gamble. The subclasses also assist in that, either rounding you out with things like magic or specializing even further into movement or damage. It can be a risk 
risky business at times, but this class is great for people who like living on that knife's edge. But rogues aren't the only ones to come out of nowhere, so do demands for you to subscribe, so do surges of life-altering magic. A sorcerer is a natural mage, flooded with magic to the core. Maybe your ancestor was blessed or cursed, or you survived exposure to raw energy, or maybe your mom just found a fae festival, and now you keep setting yourself on fire. However you cut it, you don't use magic, you are magic. And by tapping into your pool of internal power, you can fundamentally warp your magic whenever you cast. Change the size, shape, duration, damage type, hit harder. As long as you have points in your pool, the weave of magic is yours to control. Your power is also affected by your origin, with dragon scales or random effects, or flying on the wind when you cast. If you want to embody magic, not just wield it, the sorcerer is the perfect pick for you. Well, assuming you can, typically that class picks you. Some people just don't have that power, which can lead to a rash decision. There are many who would be happy to provide that power, at least for a price. Be careful if you choose the warlock, and especially where you're getting that power, because the patron you pick will grant you unique powers and spells, but they will always have more to ask. And don't think you're safe just because you didn't make a deal. A fae can bind you without you even knowing, and sometimes knowledge acts as a pact and compulsion itself. If that sort of dangerous magic sounds interesting, warlock might be your pick. They also have the easiest form of spellcasting. Instead of fiddling around with all those spell slots of different levels, they just cast everything at full power. Sure, they'll run out quickly, but while every other caster needs 8 hours of rest to refill, the Warlock just needs 1. Add in infusion powers to improve yourself and your spells, and the Warlock can be an enticing deal for those willing to risk it. Oh, and side note to future Warlocks, if you research them independently, you'll find the running joke is how they always use Eldritch Blast, a powerful signature spell they can use infinitely and modify with infusions. You may even hear about people who get mad or roll their eyes because you use it. I don't get why they care. Oh no, you're using a class feature. The Barbarian stabs every round, every sorcerer I've met cast Firebolt just as much if not more, you're fine. I've never seen someone care in an actual party, so don't get scared off by the discourse. And that's all of them. Hit that like button and... Uh, fine. Wizards are the mages that people think of first. In fact, they're the class most people think of first, so I probably don't need to tell you what they are. Something not lost on the Wizards of the Coast who made these books, because they went all in. They're tied for the most spell slots per day, they have the largest list of spells available to use in those slots by far, and they can keep adding to their spells known as long as they have gold in a reference. This lets rich wizards know more spells than anyone. They're primarily long range and have great utility and burst damage. They have the lowest hit die and can't wear armor, but they do have a spell sword subclass if that piques your interest. They also have the most subclasses in the handbook, and are one shy of having the most published overall. The wizard's been given a lot of love over the years, and I'll admit I'm bitter about it, but honestly, there's a reason, and a weird one at that. Okay, follow me here. They aren't actually a class. They're a theme. At level 1 you get your method of casting, and that is all you get. Everything else is just your subclass. Unless you somehow get to level 18, at which point you get more spells. Decently powerful, but thematically nothing, and for the vast majority of people, you will never get more than your level 1 spell casting. Now those subclasses are incredibly varied and powerful, with utility mages, blasters, skirmishers, and can even get around all the low health that people joke about. Unless you take care of the one thing that binds them all together, the spellbook. At which point they're casting and gets broken with a rusty crowbar. Though to be honest, I've never seen someone target the spellbook. I've been really tempted to, but it just felt petty. And don't get me wrong, I am petty, but not like that. Anyway, I believe that with passion and a willingness to learn, anyone can start with any class. That said, here's what I recommend for a first class. If you're new and don't know any of the mechanics, your top tiers are going to be Barbarian, Monk, and Fighter. They're straightforward and easy to pick up while you learn what's going on. Debate all you want which is easier, but they're all easy. If you want more magic, Paladin and Ranger are great. They get magic a little at a time, so you can get the cool power and theming without being overwhelmed. I especially recommend Paladin. They're hard to kill and you have a panic button and smite if you get bogged down with options. The next group would be Bard, Rogue, Sorcerer, and Warlock. The Rogue's not that complicated, but they require a bit more tactical thinking and tend to get themselves in trouble that their HP can't back up. As for your casters, they require a lot of choices during setup and level up, but that's also where you can take your time. If you're willing to learn what you can do, read through the spells you have, and do a little extra bookkeeping before session, they're still perfectly fine. Just a bit more complicated or less forgiving. Finally, we have Cleric, Druid, Wizard, Artificer, in that order. They choose which of their spell list or spells known they can cast each day, and are reliant on that magic. The Cleric's not actually that bad if you're only trying to heal or only dealing damage, but if you're trying to do both of them well, the balance can get tricky. The Druid's Wild Shape adds extra forms. Not too bad for most subclasses, but still just more to remember. The Wizard isn't as complicated, but has far less HP for mistakes, and that spell list covers two-thirds of all spells. Artificers like me only have a few spells to keep track of, but we have infusion 
illusions, and we replicate a massive list of magical items. You can overcome that, but you have to be willing to do the prep work. Still, I only recommend them if you have the time and passion to learn what they can do before you begin. And with that, for real this time, thanks for watching. Special thanks to my coffee supporters like Feral Goblin. Your donations help me pay for more equipment. My next goal is a chair to edit in. My old one broke and stabbed me. I can't put a link on screen yet, but if you'd like to help, link in the description. Every dollar is appreciated and really adds up. Anyway, class dismissed.